limitations of school aren't really what you, the best stuff you learn for your eventual career, your employment. It's really how do businesses work and things. And we didn't have computers at our school, but a trans teacher went out of the school and got me to go down to a company. Got some engineers to let me in and program a computer once a week. Wow, it was exciting. You know, my first big program was a chess program and nothing came out. It took me a couple of weeks to finally determine it was going to solve the problem, but it was going to take 10 to the 25th years. <laughs> so that having a computer that can do one million things a second, that's a huge, that's a huge fast computer that still can't solve simple problems. You still need approaches of minds, a lot of thinking. You need the human, it's much more important than that sort of stuff. And yeah, you know, so I came up and started, I started designing every computer I could get a description of on paper called computer manuals. I took chip manuals and I said, how do you make them out of chips? All on my own. No instruction, no mentors, no help, nobody helping me, no books. What did your parents think while you were doing this? They, think they, you were they just... almost didn't know what I was doing with designing the computers. I would sit down and design them on paper for myself. I would try to design them better for myself. I would try to think, is there any way I can use fewer parts? And I came up with all these, this array of tricks and techniques in my head that I knew were so incredible, they'd never be in any book. And I got really good at it, and I still thought, when I grow up, I'm going to be an electrical engineer, like my dad. I'm going to design radios and televisions, like electrical engineers do. And computers are weird things that only pop up in places called research. And I didn't, I didn't think I'd ever have a job in computers, actually, but... I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry that didn't work out for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love, I could, and thankfully, I could never afford the parts to build anything. Parts were so expensive back then. A chip would cost like 50 bucks then, that's like hundreds of dollars now, and that chip is equivalent to a light switch. Nothing, you know, yeah, so yeah. it was like almost nothing at all for a huge amount of money. You could never, as a person, afford these things. So I lived in Silicon Valley, thankfully, and there were, you know, I could get some parts donated because my dad worked for the military. The military could afford chips and things. Yeah. <laughs> and they needed them to make the weight go down in the early rockets. Every fraction of a gram you saved was important. Yeah. That's really what's made chips valuable. Before they were affordable, right. before they were really affordable. So in other words, if you had grown up in Milwaukee, you might never have gotten to where you got. True, we had no internet back then. So basically, being around, a lot of kids that knew electronics helped me, helped me you know, come up with electronic projects that impressed the friends, and we talked wild ideas that we never built, and a few wild ideas that we actually did go and build. And it was, yeah, it was really I need to be grown up. I got to see vacuum tubes. I built my own ham radio set, soldering all the vacuum tubes and parts together, seeing that go into transistors so I could build tic-tac-toe computers and then chips that I could design on paper to make real existing computers from Varian and Hewlett Packard and digital equipment and Data General and I just loved, you know, so I was, I think being in Silicon Valley put me near actually stumbling into little bits of information by accident. Or stumbling or into... Or I never would have, would have, uh, we didn't have any classes in it, there were no books on it. Or stumbling into a guy like Steve Jobs. Tell us about meeting Steve sure. the first time and, and how all yeah. of this led to Apple eventually. Sure. After a couple years of college, I took one year off to work programming a computer to earn the money for my third year of college at Berkeley. And while I was working, I told the executive I used to design all these computers. He said, did you ever build one? I said, I couldn't afford a part. He said that he had contacts with a chip company. He could get me the parts for a computer. Wow, I went home that night. I designed a very simple computer. It was a real computer, you know, with, with RAM memory and switches and lights, like all the computers of the day, the, the front panels. You, you flip a bunch of ones and zeros on switches, push a button, and the ones and zeros go into something called memory. So I, I designed it, he got me the part, I actually built it, and while I was wiring it up with a friend down the street, the friend said, you should meet this other guy that went to our high school, Steve Jobs, because he's built digital things that have counters and numbers in his place, and he also likes to, he just done pranks at the school, and I was a well-known, well-known prankster. <laughs> so, so Steve and I met, we met on the sidewalk, we started sizing each other up, what kind of pranks did you do? You know, was, 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 he, you was he wearing a black mock turtleneck? <laughs> More like what I remember is kind of shorts and a t-shirt and he might have sandals or bare feet. Okay. He was, but he was in high school and he was in that, that community of the counterculture, the hippies, the kind of, if you go through a period of life where you, you get by with nothing, but he was always searching for the greatness. From the day I met him, he was talking about books he'd read, the few great people that moved history forward, like he wanted to be one of those people, and that the path to it was to have companies. You have to make some money, and then invest that to make more money, and becoming big in money was a big part of it. So all that was coming out right from the, the moment we met. But we, we shared a lot of beliefs about um, society and, and culture, and especially, like, I appreciate the counterculture. I was not a hippie. I was gonna be an engineer with my feet on the ground, buy a house, have money, and and be, you know, very honest, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what, luckily, luckily, and luckily, I didn't get it, 
didn't have any drugs or anything, or I might have been going to parties instead of designing computers. So, um, you know, so I was more of an observer, but I appreciate people that thought different ways of life, and you couldn't challenge them with logic. That they really, their, their truths were as good as the normal culture, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and it was very, so I really appreciated them and never put them down, never saw Steve Jobs do anything like drugs, you know, I mean, I heard a lot of things. And, <laughs> <laughs> he never, he never, he knew my work, so he never brought that near me. Okay. Um, but it was, um, <laughs> and, but it was he, he was a really wild guy, so fast from point to point to point, you couldn't stop him, like ADHD, just all these ideas he could always have. And, Trying to you know push the future, and I was the, the great designer. Maybe that came from the rumors you were talking about. Okay. <laughs> hey, tell, tell us real. You mentioned the word humanistic. Talk about your thinking as you try yeah. to take these computers, as you described that you thought were just for research, to what they could be for human beings. Well, actually, the humanistic came in a lot later because I was still a solid geek, and if it did, <laughs> that, I had these many instructions and microseconds, and you could do these these computations and hook it up with such and such wires. That was great to show off because I was so shy that it was the only way I could communicate with people. Show them my great designs, and they would start talking to me. Uh -oh. And uh, you know, that's how it came about. I did my um, the reason I designed the, the what became the Apple One was five years after that little computer I built where I met Steve Jobs. And by then, the rest of the world was building that level of computer and selling it as the home coming, the home computer, the Altair 8800, and it was equivalent to what I built before. But you never go backwards in time. By now, I was way up to figuring out how to build an affordable computer that you could actually type your own programs in, solve some financial numbers, solve some puzzles, solve some, play some games, solve my work at Hewlett Packard. I was working at Hewlett Packard designing the first handheld calculators, which was the iPhone 4 of its day. You know, so I was so lucky, I didn't have a degree, but they hired me because I could do the job. So, um, so I went down this club, and, and in the club, people were talking about a revolution in society. I love that word, revolution. I always grew up feeling I want to be a revolutionary because I was kind of shunned in school. Just a bright genius who couldn't talk the way normal people did, didn't go to parties at all, and didn't drink. And so, so, I was, so, I was, um, so I was an outsider. It makes you think really independently. And uh, these people were talking about revolution, the computers were going to change the way we educate, the way we communicate big ideas to thousands of people all at once, the way we control things in our life, the way we go into the guy who knows how to program is going to calculate the financial solutions for their company and beat the big million dollar computers and the high paid gurus that program them just on their own little machine, a little fifth grader was going to be better. I love those ideas. So I said, whoa, I now saw the formula to building the affordable computer you know, the right way. And everybody else was going on one track and they said, this is how computers are done. This is how they've always been done. And I just saw a simple formula to get the whole package together affordable and built it and started, I passed it out for free. I gave it away. I gave it away. I gave away all my designs. No copyright notices, no nothing. Build your own, build your own, I said. And that was when Steve came back from Oregon where he was going to college and he came to the club and he saw this excitement about my computer. So he came up with an idea. Why don't the two of us, we've been partners, you know, best friends forever, why don't we start a company of our own? And we'll just make little $20 PC boards that will sell them for $40. That was the idea, because we didn't have no money. You know, we're in our young 20s, no money in the bank, no savings account, no relative or friends that could loan us money, nobody rich or anything. So, I mean, you just do what you have to do. You know, you've got to, but you've got to build something. And every step of the way, you know, hey, if you can't find it with the VCs, go to the angels. You just keep looking for what is the path that'll work. Yeah. And um, I was honorable to my company, HP, so I wouldn't do this, a company on the side, because I'm going to work for Hewlett Packard forever. Yeah. That was community. You talk about SAR to be in community. I really got community ingrained into me, how Hewlett Packard worked that way in those days. The, the Hewlett Packard, the HP way. And so I went to them. They turned me down five times. Really? To do these computers, yeah. And, and they would have done the wrong thing. They would have done the wrong thing. They would have done a Hewlett Packard style computer for engineers in those days. And not for people. And they would get really just <laughs> like, <laughs> really I did not leave my job. I did not leave my job. And I said, Steve, okay, let's start this little company and sold the most valuable thing I owned, my handheld calculator. I sold it to get the money to, to start out the computer. And Steve sold some, sold a van, and we got the money and kicked it off. And right away, right away, instead of instead of investing like a few hundred bucks each. He gets an order for $50,000. We have no money. No, that's twice my salary. How do you build $50,000 worth, worth of computers? Yeah. Well, we got the parts on 30 days credit. 
built the computers in 10 days, delivered them to the store for cash on delivery. Uh -huh. And that's how we ran the Apple Network. Uh -huh. That was the problem. you have and find the way you can do something positive at this stage yeah. and you know don't think I've got to go to the moon on day one. So is that is that is that the moment where you gave up your dream of being an electrical engineer? I mean were you is that the point where you knew it's just going big? No I was already a computer engineer at Hewlett Packard by right. then. I've gone past that that phase of uncertainty. But did you know that this was going to move beyond a hobby and that you were going to um, be able to do the, more than create motherboards for 10 I like the 500 people that met every two weeks at Stanford Linear Accelerator in our club, the homebrew computer club. We all felt this was going to, every home in America was going to have computers someday. We, we didn't see it as the right word. We saw people just keeping recipes and controlling their garage doors and weird things that only geeks would want to do. Um, we didn't think, nobody, even Steve and I, would have never thought that a song was someday being a computer memory. There'd be enough memory for that. You know, so, so you can't quite see today. That's just way too long a time. It's very hard to see more than, you know, maybe a year ahead. A year ahead, you're working on the, the technologies that are going to make that year happen. Two years ahead, something weird. Somebody comes up with a new program on the internet. Oh my gosh, I'd rather be doing this than improving Facebook. Or, you know, the ways, the ways of the world were so unpredictable <laughs> with what kind of hardware, what kind of companies, what kind of products. We were just, and Steve was always worried about somebody's going to outdo us in some way and just take away our Apple computer, you know, take away the success from us. Uh, he was very paranoid and worried. I'm more calm. And our marketing guy, who was our angel investor, Mike Marco, we were with an angel investor. And he was the mentor that really told us how to establish a business, what kind of people hire, what their role should be. So he's really the one who's successful, responsible for Apple being successful when all these little two-person startups had a couple of young kids that didn't know anything. And um, but he was uh, so anyway. We had um, a lot of good. We had a lot of good people, and um, and what he was very calm too. He said basically, we're a small group of people. IBM inside, we only have a small group of people working on the same thing. We can be as smart as them and hold on to our market share. And it's really a marketing game. And how did you and Steve divide up duties in those early days, or did you just both sure. work on everything? No. Nope. Um, when we started the company with this investment, the angel investment, the real one, as just a year after the Apple One, the Apple Two. And this was the computer we thought would really go places because I had this idea for color that was so strange, so different than color had ever been generated for televisions ever before in the world. A little one dollar chip doing the job of a thousand dollars circuit. And it worked. I showed Steve Jobs. You type a number into memory, a yellow square pops up on my home TV. You type another number into memory and a blue square pops up. Whoa. We knew that this machine could do every, all the arcade games were coming, they weren't even in color yet. The, the games that Atari was building in arcades. This was going to be so hot, a machine, graphics and color and pixels and everything. So we raised a lot of money, but um, in doing that, I had to agree to leave Hewlett Packard. And I said, why? I designed two computers in a year and uh, cassette tape interfaces. I wrote a basic language myself. And why don't I just keep doing this one man job? Uh, I'll just keep doing this great job on the side of HP. I love HP. I want to work there forever. And our investor said no. So it's tough. And at first I said no, but then I changed my mind and realized I can be an engineer in this company. I'm not going to try to tromp on marketing and tell them the box should be red instead of blue. You know, I'm not that kind of a person. They've been doing it for 10 years. Let them make their decisions. Nobody could beat me at the engineering. I'd be an engineer only. Steve's role was to learn how to run every division of a company and eventually, basically, be a CEO in training. And that was exactly how it was expressed in words by our angel founder who ran our marketing, Mike Markle. So then Apple II comes out. Mm -hmm. And you guys are what? You're on the cover of Time, you're on I mean, then that, was still, that was still a while down. Okay. Fortunately, it was the last day of my finals when I went back to get a degree at Berkeley. My name was known, but not my picture. Last day of finals, <laughs> our picture was on the cover of Time. Oh. I went oh. and I went under a fake name, Rocky Raccoon Clark. And that's what it was <laughs> but um, so that was a later point of time. But Apple was getting recognized all over in newspaper articles and magazine articles, home computers, and Apple was always. <coughs> the most incredible thing that had ever happened. We were better 